Hello and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on January 21st, 2022. And today we are going to be looking at uh, COVID related learning challenges as well as work that was done a couple of years ago in this, uh, in this committee. Um, so with us today, we have uh, Nate Levinson, who is the retired president of the district management group and the district management uh, wrote a, a report for us in 2017, referred to as expanding, expanding in, can't talk here, expanding and strengthening best practice supports for students who struggle. I wanted to just briefly let uh, committee members um, introduce themselves. You've met me, Kate Webb, uh, chair, retired special educator, uh, Representative Kupali. Good morning, Larry Cooperley, Rutland City. Welcome, Nate. Good to see you again. Thank you. The vice chair and our ranking member, Representative Conlon. Uh, good morning, Nate. Nice to see you again. Looking forward to uh, what you have to say. And Representative James, clerk. Hey, uh, welcome. I'm uh, Representative Kathleen James, representing the Bennington Four District. Representative Hooper, Rep Ventuve. Good morning. This is Representative Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury, and I'll be joining via video shortly. Um, Representative Toof, and then Williams. All right. Good morning, uh, Representative Toof. I represent uh, Saint Albans City and Saint Albans Town, which is Franklin Three One. Welcome. And has two youngsters. <laughs> Hi, I'm Representative Williams. I represent Essex, Caledonia, which consists of the towns of Concord, Victory, Granby, Maidstone, Gilhall, Lunenburg, Brunswick, and Kirby. Um, Representative Austin, then Brown. Yes, I'm Sarita Austin, and um, I'm from Colchester, 9-2, and I'm a former educator and school board member and I read your report in 2017 um, really really liked the report thank you. so thank you for the work you did representative brown and then brady thank you i'm representative jana brown representing the chinden one district which is the town of richmond nice to meet you and also worked on work on early literacy yes that's right my i work at a nonprofit that does literacy programming for young children and Representative Brady, and then Aronson. Hi, I'm Representative Brady. I represent Williston, and I am a social studies teacher, 15-year social studies teacher at school here today, and school board member, and I teach um, graduate education students at St. Michael's. And I also read the reports um, a couple years ago, so I'm, I'm excited. This is like a celebrity sighting for me here. <laughs> <laughs> and Representative Aronson. Good morning, Representative Arison, first year legislator from Wethersfield Cavendish. Um, and we also have our, our, uh, our legislative council in the room, whom you've met, Jim Demeray. And, uh, here. Okay. and our, one, our wonderful uh, legislative assistant, Jesse Tracy, who's organizing everything for us. No small task. Welcome, Nate. Hi. Okay, well, um, welcome, Nate, and I'm so pleased to see you again. I also understand you've been doing a bit of work related to COVID-related learning challenges. So we're 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 going to be introducing Act 173 to the committee, um, what that that act was for. Uh, but wanted to start with you to talk uh, about what you know <laughs> about. Um, how we meet the needs of students who are struggling. Great, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you. Wish we were doing this in person. Someday we will do that again. Um, this is, so uh, just very briefly, uh, my background as uh, you know, I have um, spent a lot of time in Vermont. At this point, I have probably worked with, I wanna say more than half the districts in some meaningful way and for better or for worse, have presented 20 or 25 times to statewide efforts. Um, spent a lot of days and hours and miles across the state. 
uh, going back almost 10 years now. Uh, bringing to this work is I have been a superintendent, I have been a business owner, and I have been a school board member for six years. So I've seen these challenges from lots of different perspectives. Uh, the one that matters most is, and I think the most important experience is as a superintendent, uh, my team and I were able to close the general ed, special ed achievement gap by 40 points. Uh, we reduced the number of struggling readers by two thirds. And we did that during an era of cutting the budget every darn year. Um, this is an interesting conversation to have because I, I will tell you that Act 173 is near and dear to me because uh, we, we've spent so much time trying to help struggling students and when the pandemic came, and not just in Vermont, but across the country, uh, efforts to reform and improve special education, efforts to improve uh, literacy, efforts to improve supports for struggling students, they hit, a, they hit a wall. No two ways about it. Um, the, the, you know, the world changed. They call it, you know, March 15th, give or take a day or two, everything froze. We moved into this period of education during a pandemic, the incredibly accurate and overused phrase, it was unprecedented, there was no playbook. Uh, I, my firm, and many others moved into uncharted territory as we started to help guide districts through a year like none other. So I would say everything we have done in the last six months as a consultant or as advisor to school districts in every district in your state They've been making it up as they go because nobody has had to do this before. Um, something really odd happened about a month ago as not that this year is over, but public educators, school systems, folks like yourself are starting to turn to the question of what do we do next year and the year after? A phrase that I refer to as COVID recovery. I did not coin that phrase, but I like it because there's so much to recover from. And here's the part that's just fascinating beyond expectations. There is in fact a playbook for COVID recovery. There was no playbook for pandemic education and we're still got six months to figure and muddle. Uh, but essentially what the pandemic has done is it's created a much larger group of kids who struggle. And unfortunately, we had a lot of those kids before the pandemic. And more unfortunately, we have more of them now than we've ever had before. But they're not actually unlike their pre-pandemic struggling peers. They are struggling to read. They fell behind in reading because reading instruction was interrupted. They fell behind in math. Um, they became disengaged. There are gonna be social emotional challenges because Quite honestly, hybrid and remote learning doesn't work for a lot of kids. But the part that is just really surprising as we and others started to study, what does it take to catch kids up? And let's define catching kids up. This is not just kids with disabilities because obviously we didn't get more disabilities during a pandemic. We got more kids who fell behind academically. Catching kids up means we have to make more than a year's gain in the course of a year or they will never recover. Um, and the research is pretty clear that the pandemic induced struggles and the pre-pandemic induced struggles are very similar. And what I wanna share this morning, and I'll spend about 15 minutes giving you the highlights and then take plenty of time for your questions. What does the research and practical experience show? How do you catch kids up who have fallen behind and how do you meet social emotional behavioral needs for kids who are more you know, dealing with trauma or, or disengaged? And it turns out that Vermont is in a better place than, and I've worked in 30 states now, Vermont is in a better place to address COVID recovery than I think any other state, because quite honestly, the work we did a few years ago, the work that had continued after that and Act 173, Really, if you didn't have all of that, that's exactly what you should have put in place uh, starting today moving forward, because it does turn out that Act 173 and COVID recovery are two, one plan for two challenges. So what did we learn 
Um, just very briefly, you know, the research we did, um, we spent about a year, uh, we studied 10 SUs in 11 actually before the, they merged, uh, 11 in incredible detail. Uh, we did one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face interviews with over 500 people across the state. Uh, we did 40 days of interviewing. Um, can't tell you how many miles we logged. Um, we got the schedules from over a thousand practitioners across the state. Prior to doing that study, we had actually worked with many, many, many districts in the state already. And I'll tell you, we've worked with many districts since, and all of it is a very consistent story. Um, this is one of the things that is, I will say, it's the right phrase. I'll just call it funny. Some people won't laugh. But one of the core findings was that every single person we visited in Vermont said, I'm so glad you are here because we are so incredibly different from every other school in my district, from every other district in my SU, and obviously from every other town, city, and county. And that just turned out to be not true. There are, yes, there are differences by size and differences by region, but there are so many more commonalities than there were differences. Um, so what did we find? And, and how do you help kids who struggle, whether we call it Act 173, whether we call it COVID recovery, or we just call it good education? Uh, first and foremost, and this one's gonna be really important for our recovery, is that tier one instruction, and I really will try to minimize jargon. Tier one instruction is just called what the classroom teacher does. This is, you know, six and a half hours a day with class, general education classroom teachers, what they do matters more than what anybody else does. Why is that important? Because across the state, too many people don't believe that. What happened unintentionally and with the best of intentions, classroom teachers would see a student who struggles behind in reading, struggling with math, maybe has a disability. And they said to themselves, I care deeply about this student. I am not skilled enough. I don't know what to do for them. And thank God there are these special people called special educators or interventionists. Somebody else down the hall will know what to do. And as a result, there was less ownership by the classroom teacher, not out of indifference, but out of caring of kids who struggle. There was a hope that somebody else would solve the problem. That is impossible. Students who struggle spend six hours a day with one teacher, 30 minutes a day with somebody else is not going to catch them up. Um, it also meant that kids who struggle, and, and this, if you write anything down, write this one down, kids who struggle spend less time with their classroom teacher than kids who don't. Kids who struggle get less reading instruction from their classroom teacher, less math instruction from a classroom teacher than a student who didn't struggle to read or in math. Why? Because they're leaving the room to go get some quote, extra help. You know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, oh no, Nate's leaving to get extra help. Well, it's not extra, it's instead of. The other thing that is somewhat surprising it is, you know, back in the, I don't know, 60s, 70s, 80s, we had this thing called the reading wars. I don't want to relive it. Um, I would say for the last 30 years, almost everybody has agreed reading is the most important thing you can possibly do to help a child. That if you are reading on grade level, by the end of third grade, you actually are destined for the middle class. And if you're not, that is very much at risk. For reasons that are, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you it is there. There was less focus on early literacy, early meaning K to three, you can even call it K to five. There was less focus on literacy in many, many, many of the classrooms we visited across Vermont than I've seen in most other states. I want that to sink in for a moment because I know we have a number of folks on this call who are educators, this is settled science, um, but there just isn't nearly as much focus and rigor on literacy uh, in your schools as there needs to be. 
why this is doubly important in the, um, and you know, it's not surprising, almost 40% of students, at least when we last did the study, 40% of students, elementary students struggled to read in Vermont. I can only imagine that number is probably approaching half or more given post pandemic. Why are these things important for recovery? One is if classroom teachers and school districts are thinking we're going to need massive infusions of intervention to catch kids up, and we'll get to intervention in a moment. That is not the right place to start. We need massive upgrading of core instruction, massive investment, and I don't mean money necessarily, time during the day, uh, planning during the summer in to make sure that core instruction is even better next year um, than last year. And let's face it, you have more struggling readers than ever. Um, that is, that harms students for life if you don't catch them up very quickly. Um, so that the first big finding was core instruction matters more and reading matters most. And, and I will say that intellectually, your teachers, your principals, your superintendents know this, but on the ground reality, we're not seeing it. Not because they're bad people, and we can get to why it's not happening perhaps later, but to know that it wasn't happening. Now, second, if you had that great core instruction, you had a great focus on literacy, that will help all kids, including kids who struggle. But on top of that, some kids will need more. They'll need extra help. It doesn't go away, but it's the second step. It's not the first step. Now, extra help research is really, really clear. It, again, settled science, whether it's John Hattie's Visible Learning, the What Works Clearinghouse, the National Reading Panel, or, we've just stopped debating this, at least in the research world. Kids who struggle need extra time to master the skills that they didn't master. If I struggle in phonics, spend an extra 30 minutes a day teaching me phonics. If I struggle in fractions, spend 45 minutes a day teaching me fractions. If I am a ninth grader who has struggled with seventh and eighth grade concepts, well, you can't teach that to me during ninth grade math. That whole period is taken up with something called ninth grade math. So you need another period to teach me seventh and eighth grade math because ninth grade math presumed I knew seventh and eighth grade math. This, this is called extra time intervention. Um, most of the intervention across the state, particularly two years ago, was not extra time. It was during ninth grade math, a, a teacher, a special educator, or a paraprofessional would go into the classroom and try to help. So very, very few kids in the state, a de minimis number, actually got extra minutes during the day to catch up. Um, but they need that. Most importantly, if the extra time is important, and it is, what mattered even more is who is providing the instruction during that extra time. But let's face it, if you go to a doctor and you're healthy, you, you see a generalist. And if they say, whoa, Nate, your heart's not doing so well, we should send you to a specialist. This is a person with even higher skill levels, more training, and an expertise that a generalist didn't have. They would never send you to a, you know, a person with even less training or not even a doctor for reasons, and Vermont is not alone, but you are amongst the 50 states, definitely at the very, very, very top of using paraprofessionals to support struggling students. Let's define a paraprofessional. This is a really well-meaning person who cares, who does incredibly hard work for not a lot of money. On average, there very, very few, probably less than 1% are teachers. Um, often less than half are college graduates. Um, but in Vermont, if a student struggles to read, they are vastly, like 20 times more likely to get reading help from a paraprofessional than from a teacher. So I'm gonna say that again. If a student struggles academically, they're about 20 times more likely to get help from a paraprofessional than a teacher. 
we cannot be shocked that they're not catching up. Uh, there's this theory at work that says, hey, I would rather have one less skilled adult work with one student. So this one-on-one -on -one will be the magic. But the research says three or four kids with the most skilled reading teacher is vastly more effective. Weirdly enough, it's less expensive as well. But most importantly, one is a path to reading proficiency and one is not. So breaking this habit of thinking one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional support. Now, paraprofessional is super important for kids with severe disabilities, super important for kids with behavioral challenges, uh, health and safety. They play an important role, but they do not play an important role in academic uh, instruction in catching kids up academically. Um, on average, I think we found that um, Vermont had two to three times as many paraprofessionals as the national average. Uh, some, in some cases, five and six times as many as high performing districts. So this reliance on paraprofessionals is deeply ingrained um, and not helpful. So those three taken together, this focus on core instruction, especially literacy, extra time for kids who struggle, that extra support from highly skilled teachers, that is the three-legged stool of academic recovery. Um, it, is the, it was the three-legged stool and the foundation of Act 176, excuse me, 173 as well. And it is what recovery will be. And it's not, this is not special ed. I know sometimes people refer to 173 as a special ed rule or act. It's really not. You have far more kids who struggle, even pre-pandemic, who don't have a disability. You know, about 13% of your kids have IEPs and 37% of your kids struggle to read. So it is far bigger than special ed, but it's certainly special ed is part of it. Now, if you did those three things academically, we still need to address social and emotional behavioral needs. Pre-pandemic, every district in the country had reported over a five and 10 year window, a significant increase in the number of kids with trauma, the number of kids with severe behavioral challenges, and as idyllic and at times rural as Vermont is, uh, teachers, principals across your state are reporting the same thing. Um, you know, so, some of your, your towns are really, I have, you know, 100%, I work in New York City and some of the challenges in those schools I see in your schools. Here's the difference. The, there is science on how to meet the act, excuse me, the social, emotional, behavioral needs of kids. There is good research. The problem is in Vermont, you have small districts. Even post Act 46, you have small districts. Uh, meeting the social, emotional, behavioral needs of kids takes very specialized skills. People who have masters and PhDs in behavior management people who are highly skilled therapists and counselors. Many of your schools and even many of your districts are too small to afford full-time experts in this field. Uh, generally, you need at least a few thousand kids to and maybe even four or 5,000 students before you can afford the kind of talent that your teachers and principals are begging for. So our recommendation was to think about creating some shared regional approaches to building capacity and having expertise around social and emotional behavior. And it's not because the people in the districts aren't smart enough. It's just these highly specialized people are expensive. A district of 800 doesn't need or can't afford a full-time person. But what you do instead is you ask these incredibly hardworking special educators who do not have necessarily any training in this. They don't have a master's in behavior management. You're asking them amongst all the other things they do, put on one more hat and be, be the behavior expert. Well, they are the behavior expert volunteer, but they're not an expert. And so we do think that infusing expertise 
and to do it cost effectively, probably on a regional or shared basis, will really help kids and teachers. And if you don't meet um, the social and emotional behavioral needs of kids, deal with trauma, deal with behavior, those three really great ideas, at least I think they're great ideas, to raise achievement, don't work. Um, the fourth R, reading, writing, arithmetic, the fourth is readiness. You have to be ready to learn. The social and emotional behavioral, it's the ethical and moral right thing to address, but it's just from an academic achievement point of view, it is a foundation. You have to be ready so that all those other good things I've talked about can really make a difference. Uh, the last recommendation we had is probably the only one that is not, um, I'll say recovery specific. And that was for students with very severe disabilities. This is one or 2% of all the kids in the state. Uh, Vermont is a leader of including those students in the general education setting, which is phenomenal. Uh, there is some fine tuning to how you serve them, not a retreat from inclusion, but making sure that they're getting very specialized skills, very specialized instruction to meet what their life, what's gonna be most important for them. That has not changed. Um, again, that's a group of students who have been just horribly served through remote and hybrid learning. Nobody's fault. Nobody has figured out. We have checked in with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of districts. There isn't a good pandemic plan. Post pandemic, they're just gonna need a lot of support. So those are the five recommendations for, I believe are central to recovery. They're also central to 173. Uh, the last thing I want to share, and then I will stop talking and take your questions, is how do you move forward? You know, we shared this back in 2017 a lot. Some has changed. Um, here's what we know in the years since. One, that these strategies really are cost effective. Um, and I know that you all are dealing with the waiting study and um, there's a whole financial side to this. What we have said is to lower costs, you need to do this. And I think the folks who have looked at costs said to lower costs, you need to do this. Um, I think you should do it because your kids need it. It is a plus that it is also going to be more affordable. Um, here's the downside. This is systemic change. This will require systems thinking. You can't just change a little, you can't pick and choose and say, hey, I'll do the extra time, but I won't do the content strong teachers, or I'll do this, but not that. You have to, the worst news is you have to do it all, um, which means it's gonna take multiple years to do this. So it's unfortunate we haven't gotten as far as we would have liked. Uh, the pandemic clearly threw a wrench in this, but you want to get started soon, but you're going to need to continue for years to get this fully up and running, um, which has two implications. You have small districts. The, the central offices, and you know, I've worked with so many of them, they still wear two and three hats. They are managing COVID and they're going to manage a recovery. It is unlikely all but one or two of your largest districts have the bandwidth to implement all of these changes on their own. Um, for, whether it's the district management group, me, anybody, outside help is very expensive. I know that, you don't have to tell me that. Um, you need to, I believe, to do this economically, have regional or statewide support. There's also a lot of research that says moving together, five, 10, 20 districts at once, not only is it cost effective, it actually gets you there faster. You create what's called positive peer pressure, where you say when, 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 when one principal says this will never work and three other principals say, actually, we've been doing it for a year now, or we've rolled it out and here's how we overcame that. Um, because this is the last, and I wanna end on what is really the most optimistic note. So the idea that special ed COVID recovery can end on an optimistic note is since 2017, since we shared this report, we have presented it, I wanna say probably 50 or 70 times at this point. Um, across the state, there is so much will and desire to implement these ideas. I have never seen this anywhere I have worked before, 
when the special ed directors, quite honestly, who always hate kind of change like this, have been the strongest supporters. Uh, we have been asked to present to their membership time and time and time again. Uh, superintendents, sometimes who aren't always that excited about special ed or um, have wanted and asked for our help time and time and time again. This idea of finding extra time through the AOE, uh, a year or two ago, we did a series of presentations across the state on how to find that extra time. Um, out of 500 presentations we have given in the last decade, the largest attendance as a percentage of you know, districts attending was in Vermont when we talked about how to find extra time for struggling students. Uh, there is a groundswell, a word I seldom use, at the parent level, at the teacher level, at the special ed director level, at the principal level, superintendent level, to implement these things. That was before the pandemic. I think it will be double that after the pandemic, but they are hungry and need some kind of regional support uh, because I just, it's too big of a lift for small districts to do on their own. Let me stop there and love to take your questions or hear your thoughts. I first just want to thank you um, so much for, for this presentation. What do, what is your sense of what is holding us, what is holding Vermont back from this level of implementation from your observation? So I, I think two things, you know, as you all know, this will be no surprise to you. You guys like local control. You like your small districts. Um, this is too big to go it alone. And, and I think people know that, but you do not have as a state an infrastructure for regional and statewide support. And I think that is a legacy of leave us alone, we can manage this, a district of 54, I don't need anybody else. Um, so I think you have a legacy of independence, which unfortunately is not helpful in this case. Um, I appreciate local control, don't get me wrong, but some things need a group effort. Uh, so I think that's number one. I think number two, I think the agency of education, which I, I do generally believe supports this approach, um, hasn't, I don't think they've figured out what their role is or how best to support this. Um, and whether it's statewide, whether it's a bunch of regional efforts, I think that as you know, uh, just before the pandemic, agents of education had a lot of vacancies, you know, a lot of turnover. So I think their capacity was limited. I think there is always a challenge of whether an agency provides direct support with their own staff or outside third parties. I think that is a discussion they are still having. And then I think the pandemic came and rightfully all of this froze, but you don't have a history of regional multi-year sustained support. And you're gonna to have to create that in some way, shape or form. Um, and I think from a capacity point of view, uh, your agency of ed is very small. You know, we have advised and studied many, many agencies of ed. I mean, some of them fill like 17 floors of downtown high rises. I am not exaggerating. Um, you know, all of your senior leaders can fit in a conference room. Um, that the bandwidth to do something of this magnitude may not live within the agency either. And then you add this, everything related to COVID, you know, whose job is it? Everybody's wearing 10 hats. Thank you. Um, so I'm opening up to questions, comments, um, Representative Arison. Thank you, Chairman Webb. Um, does Vermont have barriers in place to, um, let me rephrase this. We have re re reciprocity with other states for allowing uh, educators to come in. I guess where I'm going. I want to lower any barriers that we have that might prevent educators from coming to Vermont that may have all the qualifications, but we don't have a reciprocal agreement with the, with the, another state. 
Um, it seems to me that there's probably people out there that, that are at, uh, rise to the level that you described, but may have some kind of barrier in place that doesn't allow them to come to Vermont other than the physical problems. Great, great question. So I think if we break the need into three categories, so you need great classroom teachers. That's because that's where the core instruction starts. I don't think you have any more barriers than anybody else. Um, I think where uh, some barriers do arise is you know, when you think about these extra help folks, uh, one of the large pools that we've seen is um, retired teachers. So you want to look at, and I have not, but how easy is it for a retired teacher to come back to work a few hours a day, uh, to be those extra help teachers? That's a pool people have looked at. And then on this area of the behavior specialists, there's a national shortage. And so one of the things that I have suggested to anybody who will listen is you can't import them. And there are almost, there are fewer than a dozen, I think, in the state currently. It's a, you know, it's like, the minimum number, um, you're going to have to develop your own. Um, there are ways of doing that that are very cost effective. But again, this is where an individual school district cannot afford to build a program to train a behavior specialist. But a state or a regional entity could, and then that very person would be shared. So I think that behavior folks are going to need to grow, uh, interventionists and extra help folks, um, you just want to make sure that part-time and retired folks can jump in. And I think on the classroom teacher side, the bigger, um, I would say, sort of bigger obstacle is um, philosophical. If you believe a power professional is the best possible solution, you will run an ad, you will find them, you will fill them, and you will feel good. And we have to stop feeling good about that. Thank you. Representative Brady. All right, I'll, it, it's the impossible question, but how do you, I, I mean, I'm in schools. It's yes, absolutely. <laughs> All of that is true. How do we change, aside from the technical, the skill part, the, the mindset, the philosophical, it, it is so ingrained in, in the way that classrooms operate. So, and where are there, are there examples to point to, especially, you know, in New England of successes in, in doing that, of really rethinking the role, the primary role of the classroom teacher? Yep. So the good news is, and I agree with you, it is, it is a huge mind shift. Um, the good news is because we have been at this and banging this drum for you know, coming on a decade now, there are in fact school districts in Vermont who are three and four years into the implementation, who have reduced the number of powers, increased the number of reading teachers, seen their achievement rise. Um, because I will admit that if I showed every district, somebody from New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, for every district, somebody from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and brought them to Vermont, you guys don't care. Um, but the, the good news is we are at a point where there are actual examples in, in the state. And again, I think that the sh what's different here from what I've ever seen before is at the leadership level, uh, special ed directors, principals, they get it. Um, normally, and I do believe that leaders have to lead, that they have to make this a moral issue. They have to really believe it. And, and again, we're not starting from zero. They do believe this. Now, the, here's what I probably don't know. I'm not sure that they realize that the plan we had talked about that was called Act 173 is actually the COVID recovery plan. That, that's, that one, you know, we haven't had a lot of that conversation yet, but I think they will get there quickly. But I, I really think that what they're telling me or telling anybody who will ask is they are ready to implement this. But, there are, but they need like the moral suasion of a team, that positive peer pressure, and they need some technical assistance. Like they go and look at their schedules and they say, I don't know where to find the time. Or they say, hey, what would you do during those extra uh, time periods? Or how do you identify those kids? So there's definitely the philosophical shift. There's definitely the technical shift. 
you need to address both of them simultaneously, but happily you have leadership momentum, which is unprecedented in a positive way for a change. Can I ask a follow-up question there too? Um, oh. How does this apply to all teachers versus like K to three? Um, and <clears throat> So this is a hundred percent true at middle school and right. high school as well. Um, the idea that in middle schools and high schools across your state, if a student struggles, and I'll just use math as an example, like a, a student who doesn't struggle gets one period of algebra one, 47 minutes a day. A student who does struggle gets 47 minutes of algebra one. And maybe a special education teacher comes into the classroom during algebra one. Almost no kids in the state get a second period of math at the middle school or high school level where they say, hey, I know you're learning algebra one at nine o'clock, but you are still struggling with fractions, which is central to success in algebra one. So we're gonna spend some time this afternoon and every afternoon catching you up there. So the need for the extra time is actually as important and in more short supply uh, middle school and high school. And again, we're seeing more middle schools and high schools recognize that and want to think through how to uh, staff it, how to schedule it, but it's as as important as at the elementary. I see a real a, a, a concern at the high school level that there's probably more skill within schools to deal with math catch up and recovery, but when it comes to literacy and a, a 14, 15, 16 year old who's really behind in literacy, um, and I say that as a social studies teacher, um, I'm essentially going to sort of my gut and what I know and the fact that I'm teaching my own little kids to read, but I, the, there's a tremendous lack of skill, I think, of what does it mean when you get higher and higher, especially in terms of literacy. Um, uh, so what, what we're seeing, the best practice is that middle and high schools, you get in a perfect world, there's never a sixth or a ninth grader who struggles to comprehend. We don't live in that perfect world. Um, what we're, the best practice is first day of sixth grade, first day of ninth grade, you are screening. It's usually not phonics, but it's comprehension, it's fluency. And kids who are struggling to read get a class called reading. And at a high school, it is credit bearing. And to your point, most importantly, it is taught by somebody who is a trained secondary reading teacher. You know, English teachers, sorry, social studies teachers, yeah. that's not their skill set. And it is a skill. People get degrees in it. They know how to do it. Um, you know, it's not that 50% of your kids need it, but for that 10% or so, it's life changing. Yeah. It's a very weird thing that if you look at the course catalog of every high school in America, uh, fewer than 1% have a course called reading. And yet we know from the name. Yeah you know, 20, 25% of those kids need it. And then I'm in a, sorry, I'm in a medium sized school and we don't have that kind of reading specialist even here, yeah. And there's the complexity of, if you're adding something by your six and a half hour day, then you're subtracting something. And you have worked with, with districts on how to uh, create, turn six and a half hours into what? Well, so it, the, here's the nice part is we do not need to lengthen the school day. Um, and almost none of the districts we work with do. Here's what we need to do. Say out loud, reading is too important. And then all of us, and then actually get creative. So here's a two very quick examples of creative. Uh, one is kids with disabilities often have a period called resource room, where quite honestly, not enough learning takes place. Uh, one of the key fundamental thoughts behind Act 173 was that a student with a disability should still get their instruction, not just from a special educator, not from a paraprofessional, but why couldn't a gen ed reading teacher meet an IEP? That period is already in their schedule. Second, if you look at, say, at a high school, kids who struggle very seldom take four years of foreign language, they very seldom take four years of any subject that isn't required to have four years to graduate. So rather as a freshman, taking all the classes, you know, science, social studies, foreign language, 
any of those courses that could be put off a year. So you only if you're only going to take three of them, take the extra help in math or in reading as a freshman. So that when you do take the social studies class a year later or um, whatever class you're delaying for a year, you're going to do so much better at it. We have a lot of history in our schools. Our schedules are very traditional and just rearranging when you take things can, can open up the space. Thank you. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Um, I have, I wrote down a bunch of questions last night. I, I'm not gonna ask them, Kate. Thank you, Walt. <laughs> make sure we have room for others too. <laughs> um, I'll ask two. One is um, just being uh, an educator and a for, for, former school counselor, I'm wondering if you could combine social, emotional, uh, um, intervention with literacy. I, I just, I just feel like reading and writing, you know, could really, uh, in a creative way, um, meet the social and emotional needs of kids. So that that's just one thought. And then, um, how, you know, the whole word of struggling. I'm trying to understand, like, how does a teacher know when a child is, is just struggling with a new acquisition of skills as opposed to struggling that they're not getting it? Sure. Uh, two great questions. I think to your first, what you described is a really great strategy. It's called the, the integration of social and emotional learning into the core content. And I think reading, writing, social studies tend to be the three um, places where that has been most easily done. When I say easily, and again, this is where the challenge of being a small district, when you ask a teacher to do that, it is hard. Asking every teacher in the state to do it on their own is foolish. Asking teachers to come together as a group, probably across multiple schools to do it together is just so much easier. And so as a group effort, because it it's a great idea it takes a fair amount of planning. Um, so just how do you plan at scale and efficiently? But it, it's a great idea. Is there, a, is there a resource or a book that, you know, or that you would recommend? Um, let, let me look into that and I will get you back a, a name. There are definitely folks who have you know, mapped this out. Thank you. Um, the other question about um, how do you know who's struggling? So. Part of core instruction, part of great core instruction is to monitor learning, checking for understanding. Um, and yes, yeah, some kids learn at different paces and sometimes you gotta go back a couple times. Um, what schools need to do, and a fair number of yours have, they don't do enough with it, but they are assessing kids, you know, say three times a year at reading. We see a lot of that. What we don't see is the right stuff happening afterwards. And so you know, my general rule has been that you can identify struggling kids in a couple of ways. So there's this test called phonemic awareness. This is not what you learn. This is how your brain is wired. Uh, you can assess that the first day of kindergarten. And if you struggle with phonemic awareness, it's not because you weren't taught. It's because it's the way your brain formed and wired and you can start intervening there on the second day of kindergarten. Um, for kids who are learning to read, yes, yeah, certainly um, if it, you know, sight words or sounds, you might, you want to fall maybe six months behind. You can, and then you say, okay, I don't want to wait a whole year. It's less than a year. It's more than a week with the one exception around phonemic awareness. Um, and then you just fine tune it. Um, you know, I've done these studies where you go back and you say, hey, we're, look at all our kids who are struggling in third grade. Well, we have all this data back from the first day of kindergarten. Where did we start to see them uh, fall off so we should have intervened sooner? But again, I think there's pretty good data across the state. I think there's just not enough happening. And have you seen, do you have any data about lowering the cost of special education when these interventions are put into place K-3? Yeah. Uh, yeah, two things happen. So um, 
first of all, all of these interventions that we're talking about are just less costly than what you're doing today. Um, it, that you have this irony of you have said, hey, we're going to use low skilled folks who don't get paid a lot, but some places give them benefits, which is very expensive. But more importantly, you said, and we need an army of them. So just going to like say skilled teachers, you, you know, right now, like a paraprofessional helps two or three kids. Um, so three paraprofessionals are helping six or seven students. A full-time skilled reading teacher across the country helps 35 kids on average. So you actually, you created a system that says we need a boatload of people, but not, a, but, and having a far smaller number of highly skilled people would make a much bigger difference. Your group sizes are gonna go up. You're gonna have five kids in an intervention, not one and two, but it is less expensive. You will also see fewer kids ultimately referred for special needs because 40% of all kids in the country have an IEP, not because they have a disability, but because we failed to teach them to read because they learned to read in ways that are different, not necessarily disabled, but different. So, and then of course, most exciting, these interventions in a year or two can catch you up, sometimes in as little as six or nine months. Uh, special education, uh, once you end, that's a 12 year run. It is very rare that anybody has exited special ed services. So I beg to differ. <laughs> said the retired special educator. <laughs> um, I do know that that our that the, my district, which is a large district, did um, in the work that, that did with, with um, DMG, I, I believe uh, turned 20, got, got rid of 22 paraeducators and, and hired three um, master level uh, teachers. So that was an example of, of some of the ways that, that we're using money in a, in a different way, um, to, in a more professional way. Um, Thank you. You're good then, Sarita. Um, Representative James. Thank you. Um, I, I think that our previous conversations have answered my question, but I just wanted to make sure that I'm totally understanding um, <clears throat> that in order to implement this, it requires obviously leadership and a, and a culture mind shift. It does not require additional funding what it requires is um, two levers. You need to pull two levers, scheduling and who you hire. Um, yeah, so scheduling and who you hire, definitely. I think it will require that, that kind of mind shift, you know, for people to, you can't make people do this. You know, when an IEP team gets together, if they write the worst possible plan, it's still the plan you have to do. And they're, if they're writing a plan that's not great, it's because they think it's great. I mean, you have nothing but good people writing it. So uh, I totally agree in the scheduling and it's people, but if we don't get the mind shift, um, that's the, I think the third ingredient. And, and I think that there is going to be like all change because it's such a, this is a cultural bucket of cold water because you have such a long history of doing it the other way. I think there's a small investment very to help people through that change. Um, but it is, you know, Representative Webb shared, you know, the, the ability to fund this through small changes in their budgets are very real, but we just, you know, I talk about this and I hope not glibly, this is powerful. It really does work, but I wanna be respectful for, it feels so different from 20, 30 years of practice. And you know, and, and that is actually, you know, we're humans. Change is not our forte. Representative Brady. It, it um, seems like, you know, despite every horrible thing that's happened, this is actually an opportunity uh, and it's gonna pass us by really fast <laughs> um, to, to pair this sort of cultural mind shift, sort of package it in COVID recovery and re-engagement re in a way that I think 
maybe takes away some of the defensiveness of like, as if teachers are doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and something that I think all teachers are aware of, which is that this year has been a crazy rough year for almost everyone. Um, it, it just seems like it's like, it, it's a, um, a moment here where there is an opportunity with leadership mm -hmm. to do that. I'm, I'm fearful that the demands on the logistics of how far away kids can be, how many can be on a bus, what the things where the plexiglass is going to have to be will, will be so big that we won't use and leaders won't have the capacity, the time, the mm. space to use this moment <laughs> for that. But I do see this in a way, an opportunity to speed up some cultural philosophical shifts that otherwise I'm, I'm a little baffled at how we really get to them aside from some really strong leadership. Professor Brady, I wanna build on that because I would agree, but add a, an extra. So I believe this is an inflection point in the sense that it is an opportunity for change. And if there is a silver lining, this could be it. But it's also though, here's the, but it could also be the time in which bad habits become hardened even more so. In a, in a crisis, we all revert to what we know and are comfortable with. I, I just believe in my heart of hearts, based on no facts, that we have folks across your state thinking, CARES Act money is coming, kids are behind, I know exactly what to do. Twice as many parents, uh, three times as much intervention, pull these kids out of core instruction, even more so too busy to rethink the schedule, um, gearing up for more kids to be referred to special ed. So like, I think because there's this moment in time, either we're going to do more of what we have been so comfortable doing and take all that extra money, and there is some money coming to get, I can see you having 50% more parents a year from today. Or I could see people saying, this is too big a moment. We have too many kids who are struggling. The past practices didn't actually catch them up. This is very much the time. And to your point, it is a, it's a no insult, no criticism moment because we can't really think that next year should look just like last year. So I agree with you, but I'm also, I'm optimistic and very nervous at the same time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have Representative Conlon be the, be the, be the, last, the last one. Um, I, then I want to take a five minute break and then we're going to have, um, we will have uh, Jim Demaray is going to present Act 173, which was our bill that was attempting to um, implement some of the, the, the uh, goals of, of the report that, and, and the, the, the the structure of schools that uh, Nate Levinson was talking about. Um, and some of the things, the challenges we ran into in terms of our, our current way that we fund special education that actually is restricting uh, our ability to implement some of these things. So um, Representative Conlon, and then we'll take a five minute break after you're, you're finished. Uh, following up on the, the previous question, you know, there will be this um, ESSER money, ESSER two money, that's gonna go directly to districts. And uh, it almost seems like um, a good use of that would be to have expanded planning time, otherwise known as paid planning time for educators before the start of the next school year in order to do this professional development and really pivot as quickly as possible. I, do you think that would be a sound investment with the money or do you think it should go elsewhere? So um, I would love to see the extra dollars used to help make these changes happen. Um, so I'm with you there completely. Um, I've used the phrase a few times, systems thinking. Um, professional development, which I would define as like a smart person coming in to share knowledge or bringing a bunch of people around the table to share with each other. That is a component of making this happen. But if we brought all the teachers together and they said, well, we need to have reading teachers. Well, teachers don't have that authority. Um, if you brought folks together and said, hey, we need to change what's in IEPs, well, like a PLC or a planning session for PD doesn't allow that. So I, I definitely agree with you that we need to do that kind of 
professional development. We need to give teachers time to plan. But it's such a, this is the bad part of everything I've shared today. You have to get five or six things to happen together. Change who you hire, change what you wrote to IEPs, change what the schedule looks like, um, help teachers navigate this. And if you just do one or two of them, you will in some ways just create a lot of frustration um, and more awareness that you're not doing what needed to be done. So it's, to me, the question is, is how do you get all four or five of the necessary pieces to happen simultaneously? And that's why it didn't, with all the willingness of folks in the field to do this, why it hasn't taken off is it takes structure, organization, planning, and each of your districts are pretty small. So it's a heavy lift for them. So yes, it's part of the answer, but we need all the parts and pieces. That's what sticks. But it's so great if you can actually do it. The, the, the change for kids is just remarkable, life-changing in fact. Hi, thank you um, so very much for, for bringing this uh, back into our committee. We've been sort of um, drowning in education finance of late and getting back into what we're actually doing in the schools, I think provides some relief. Um, we are going to take a five minute break um, and then we will we will look at Act 173. Nate Levinson, um, if, if you're available to stay in the room, we would welcome your presence. But if you need to go and get some exercise or live your life, we understand that too. Uh, unfortunately, I do have another meeting to, to yeah. join. So um, I will have to leave you. I'm always happy to come back anytime you want or continue this conversation with any of you when Thank you want. You. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. Much appreciated. Okay, um, we will go offline and take a break. Um, I think we'll put up the break thing. I, everybody just, I, I'm just going to put myself on mute and get rid of my, you know, take myself off video and we'll just take a five minute break. So, as we continue, um, thank you, Jim Demeray, uh, our Ledge Council, who is going to give us an overview of Act 173 that we passed in 2018. We passed it in 2018. Then there was a huge uh, staff changes at the Agency of Education, um, which I, I'll tell you about at, at the time. We had change in secretary. We had change in we had change, change in leadership. Five of the five of the people that were at the agency that worked on on this bill with us all uh, retired or, or left. So um, it was an interesting move when we got to 2019. So Jim Demeray, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so for the record, Jim Demeray, that's consul. Um, the uh, <laughs> The Act 173 is a 60 page bill. So I am not gonna walk you through that bill. It's very complicated. Um, but what I do propose to do is start by just talking about um, how special education funding works now and how the bill will change that. And then I'd like to share my screen if I could um, and bring up the bill and go through some of the, the, the findings and the, and the goals, and then just go through a few sections if that's okay. Um, yeah, Jim, are, are you going to explain why we why we the census based funding came up in the first place? The moving away from okay reimbursement model. Okay. okay. So um, so there were two the Joint Assembly commissioned two studies. Um, and these studies were commissioned back in what, 2016, okay? One of them was the one you just heard, heard about, which was DMG. That study was looking at delivery of special education services. How best are special education services delivered um, in Vermont? What are the best practices to use? And you, you just heard about that from, from Nate Levinson. Um, the second study that was done was around funding. How best is special education funded? And that study was done by UVM, by Tammy Colby, who I think is coming on shortly. So there are two studies done, commissioned at the same time, that were delivered at the same time, 
And the combination led to Act 173, which basically uh, changes the way special education is funded and delivered, okay? Um, so let me start by just explaining um, how special education is funded today. Um, we have a reimbursement system um, now, and the way that works is that um, for students on an IEP, um, the cost of providing services to those students is shared. Um, the, um, the state picks up 60% of the cost uh, of those uh, services and the local school districts pick up 40%, okay? Uh, there's some federal funding as well, um, not much. I think it's about 6%. So when you, after the 6% uh, federal funding, then you get to this 60, 40 split, 60 state, 40 local. Um, and what that means is, is that over the course of the year, um, school districts are, are accounting for the cost of providing those services for these students and is submitting basically an invoice to the state for 60% of those costs. Um, and so just stopping there for a second, um, what, what we'll come to in the bill and from these two studies is the view that A, it's expensive because it's reimbursing all costs with no, no pressure to lower those costs. It's just wherever they are, they're paid. Um, and two, uh, there is a, a belief that there, this causes an over-identification of students for an IEP because it's a way of getting funding. Um, so there are a couple of things happening with our current system that came out in the funding report by Tim Colby and UVM. Um, and those things, the reimbursement model also impedes uh, adopting the best practices that you just heard about from, from um, Nate Evanson. Um, it's hard to move to a new system of delivery when you're on a reimbursement system. Um, the other thing about our system today is I mentioned it's a 60-40 split, um, except for very, for students who require a lot of support. So if you're if, you're, if, you, if you have a student on IEP that um, is costing more than $50,000 a year, okay, then the reimbursement of the first 50,000 is 60-40, but above the 50,000, the reimbursement is 90% by the state, 10% by the school district. So there's more state support for students who are very expensive to support. So um, that's how it works today. Um, what we're moving to under Act 173 is a census-based system. And what that means is rather than paying reimbursement for these services, instead, school districts will count every student, whether they're on the IP not an IP, whether they need support or not, every student that's enrolled in that district is counted. So let's just say you've got a school district with a thousand students. And the way the census grant works is that there'll be funding by the state on a per student basis. So let's say, for example, um, that the formula says we're going to pay $3,000 per student, okay? If a school district with, with 1,000 students, you just multiply 1,000 students times 3,000, and that's the amount they will get for that year. And that money, um, it's not tied, that money is not tied to um, having, sorry, that money has more, um, more liberal use around it. So that money then can be used to support students who struggle. So now we're taking basically a reimbursement model that's targeted toward to just IEP students. 
So our census-based model that's based, that is targeted to any student that struggles for any reason. So if you're having trouble reading or math, but you're not on IP or 504 plan, but you're having you need more support, this funding is designed to support you as well. But first priority for this money has to be students on IEP because that's a federal mandate that you have to put those students first. But the idea of this new funding system is to move away from reimbursement to funding on a per student basis for all students in the school district and um, can be used more broadly uh, to support these students. Can I add one, one little little piece here? One of the, the other reasons to, to move to the census-based funding model is, um, let's say you had a, a child who, that was on an IEP for a reading disability, uh, you could be reimbursed uh, for services of a special ed paraeducator, but you would not necessarily be reimbursed for the services of a certified reading teacher master level because they're not certified special ed. So there was there was confusion there as well that sometimes the, the current model was restricting kids from having access to, to some of the people who could who could help. Is that accurate would you say? That's accurate. I said one more thing about that too, which is um, because of the special education rules basically at the federal level, um, the way it works today, I believe, is if you say you have a class of 20 students um, in math, say, and um, three students are on IEP, okay, and three students are not on IEP, but they're struggling with math, okay? The way it works today, I believe, is the three students on IEP get taken out of class, uh, are given special instruction by a paraeducator or someone else, um, but the three students who are struggling, who are not on IEP, are not taken out because uh, you have to account for your, the costs of those three special education students on IEP. So it's very hard to bring out or to, to give more services to a broader group of kids who are struggling because your funding is tied to one group. Um, and the idea with the census-based funding is it's more liberal you can target that extra educational time to all of the kids who are struggling, not just to ones who are on IEP. Okay. So if, if there are no further questions at this point, which I'll wait for, um, I was going to ask to, to be co-host with Jesse so I could share my, sc my screen and uh, pull up Act 173. You are also to go, Jim, your co-host. I am? Yeah. Okay, so screen share. And... Oh, more call. Uh... Okay, this is... Sorry, guys, this is not working for me, but it'll work. You can see it. You can see what? I, I can see the bell. Oh, oh good. Okay, good. I can see so, the act, rather. It's on, on a different screen. It's on my other computer. Okay, I'll bring it over here. Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, this is a long bill uh, and very technical. Um, so I won't torture you with all that. Okay, hang on a second. We, we lost the bill. It switched yeah. screens. Oh, okay. So I'm going to move it back over to where it was before. Yeah, it's uh, just a little teeny W document. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So with this too, the banner is in my way. Okay. And this is Jesse. Feel free to, to let me know if you want me to share as well. There it is. It's back. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. I'm not going to be looking at you now because I'm looking at my other screen. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm looking over here. Um, so, um, red line bill, but I want, I want to go to um, page two. These, these are the findings we're in. And um, so in, in subparagraph C at the top, um, it says, uh, it talks about the delivery of services report. That is the DMG report you, you just heard, heard about. 
So that report made five recommendations on best practices for de delivery of special education services. Uh, one, ensure core instruction meets most needs of most students. Two, provide additional instructional time outside core subjects to students who struggle rather than providing interventions in so instead of core instruction. Three, ensure students who struggle receive all instruction from highly skilled teachers, i.e. not per educators. Uh, four, create or strengthen a systems-wide approach to supporting positive student behaviors based on expert support. And five, provide specialized instruction from skilled and trained experts to students with more intensive needs. So you've heard about that from, from, from Nate. The funding report, the UVM report, um, noted uh, uh, in D here, um, it noted a couple of things. Um, it said that the reimbursement model funding that I just described has a number of limitations in that it, one, is administra administratively costly for the state and localities. It misaligned with policy priorities, particularly with regard to delivery of a multi-tiered system of supports and positive behavioral intervention supports. The three creates misplaced incentives for student identification, categorization, and placement. Four, discourages cost containment, and five, is unpredictable and lacks transparency. Um, so it goes on to say, the funding report says, um, it assessed various funding models that support students who require additional support, including a census-based funding model. A census-based funding model would award funding to supervisory unions based on the number of students within the SU and could be used by SUs to support the delivery of services to all students. The final report noted the advantages of a census-based model are that it's simple and transparent, allows flexibility in how the funding is used by SUs, is aligned with the policy priorities of serving students who require additional support across the general and special education service delivery systems, and is predictable. So uh, and then it goes on to say that John somebody agrees with this. Um, and then the goals of the act uh, are to enhance the effectiveness, availability, and equity of services provided to all students who require additional support, um, to uh, change um, the, from a reimbursement model to a census-based model, um, to uh, recognize that students on IP are entitled to a free and appropriate public uh, education in the least restrictive environment, um, and that the changes are intended to facilitate the exercise of this entitlement. Um, and then um, the, the act also, because of the language, but the act also recognized that the census-based for, formula, um, which again is going to be based on a per person grant, Okay, per student grant. Let's go back to my example of $2,000 per student. That in some cases, for some SUs that have a very high level of students who need additional support, there might need to be more funding, additional funding for those school districts. Um, and so the act said, we don't know how to address that today. So what the act did is said, it, it, it said we need to look into that part further. So while we're moving to a census grant and the census grant amount will be the same for every student, we might need a supplemental amount for student, certain SUs. And um, when Tammy comes on to talk about um, what she's done, part of that work she's done is recommending how to address that supplemental payment. I won't go into that right now, but just know that that's a conversation that's out there. Um, in terms of the bill, again, I'm not going to go through the bill language. I just want to skip over to um, the Census Based Advisory Group uh, that was created by this bill. Um, let's see, way down here. Here we go. Um, 
Okay, so the bill created this uh, census-based funding advisory group. Um, and its job is to uh, make recommendations on the implementation of the census-based model funding. Um, membership were the Vs, uh, uh, so typical uh, players here, you'll see. Um, NEA, Secretary, um, uh, Basco, um, um, school board officer. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, yes. You've got um, a teacher, a special ed teacher. You've got a member selected by the Vermont Legal Aid Disability Law Project. Uh, you've got a member who is a family member, a guardian, etc., of a person needing special education services, and the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Um, and then one member who represents approved independent schools. Uh, a member uh, selected by the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators, um, who's a special education teacher. Uh, so um, that's the group. We will, be hearing, we will be hearing from the chair of that group uh, this afternoon. Megan Roy will be coming in. Yep. So they're advising and they're giving them a number of reports over a number of years to help advise you as to how this is going. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop in the bill there. I'm going to screen share with you a different thing, um, which is the timeline. Let me just see if there are any questions uh, at the moment. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close that and see if I can find uh, where am I right here? I want to find um, actually. Let's go back, Tracy. Uh, Jesse, sorry, and um, you take over if you would and put up that other document, which, which was called the SPED timeline for me, if you Yeah, with me here just for a moment. And I would encourage folks if it, if it is easier, um, rather than watching it on Zoom, that you can pull it up on our, our webpage under today's date. Okay. So this, okay. So this is kind of small. Can people see this? Can hey, I, why don't I give oh. folks, folks a minute to just um, pull it up on, on another screen. But at any rate, we, I think it's just going to show the flow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm you hoping. Need, we can, yeah. OK, well, I'm hoping people can see it. Um, What's going on? I apologize. I'm just trying to see if I can make it any bigger here. That's a little bit better. <laughs> That's better. That's better. Thanks, okay. Jesse. Thanks. Okay. So, um, and then scroll down just a little bit, Jesse, so we, we get the very bottom bar. Um, I'm not able to scroll on this view only. That's okay. as far. Okay, so first of all, you'll see this is version eight <laughs> of this timeline, and it tells you how many times we've changed the date to roll out this um, change. Um, this is the change in funding. So um, the the box um, the box in the middle here tells you that for fiscal year 19, 20, 21, and 22. We are on the reimbursement model. We're not switching until fiscal year 23, okay? And then in the first year of census-based funding, actually takes five years, five years, one, two, three, four, five, until fiscal year 27 to fully phase it in. I won't go through why. This is where it gets really, really complicated. But um, basically what's happening is um, we have to make adjustments over time to get all supervisory unions um, using the same um, formula for the grant. Um, and so it takes five years. Uh, you have one year of really moving to grant funding, but it takes four more years to actually have everybody operating the same way. So I can explain that further if you want me to, but just to say it's a five-year phase in 
but from 23, fiscal year 23 on, we are under the new, new census grant funding model. Um, and the way that, it, that they're gonna be experiencing it is that some districts are going to see that grant go up and some are gonna see that go down. So it's a way of not hitting everybody, uh, the people that would lose all at once. Yeah, just very briefly on that, what happens in the first year of fiscal year 23 is it's not really a census based grant that year. What it does is it gives you basically what they got the year before from reimbursement, but it's a grant. So rather than a reimbursement, they're getting the money in a grant form, but the same money they got basically the year before. And then um, but what that does is they're all getting different amounts because they all have different amounts of reimbursement uh, and they all have different number of students. So in order to compute the per student amount of grant, you would take the grant might an SU got in 23 and divide by their student count. And every SU would do that. That's gonna come up to a different figure, a different figure per student for all the SUs, because you're gonna have a different denominator and a different numerator. But you wanna to get to a uniform amount per, per student eventually. So what happens is for fiscal 23 and fiscal 27, um, that amount for each SU is moving toward, uh, toward a common number for all SUs. So they're gradually moving up or down to the uh, 20, fiscal year 27 and then the amount per student is the same for all SUs. So that's the summary of, of that process. Uh, if you look up further um, above here, um, you've got, first of all, the reports of the advisory groups. You have a report back in um, uh, 19. Uh, you have a report in, uh, um, second report in 20 um, on January 15th. That's the report coming in now. You have a third report coming in 21. You have a fourth report coming in 22. So you have four reports from the advisory group telling you how it's going. Um, and you have above here, you have the state board adopting rules to implement the census-based model. Um, and you had the waiting report. So the waiting report was also commissioned in Act 173. And uh, it, was, it was delivered um, in uh, 2019, and now of course you're dealing with that report now as to what to do with it. Um, down here below, uh, you've got funding for AOE. So AOE, uh, AOE was giving, given funding to support SUs for three years um, in uh, changing its delivery model. Um, and um, AOE, AOE was also given three staff to, um, to help out in this area of permit staff members. The very bottom line that you're not seeing over here very well is a whole different topic. It was also part of Act 173, so I'll mention it, which is independent schools. So independent schools um, uh, under Act 173, starting in fiscal year 24, are going to be required if they take public funds to also accept students on, on the IEP. So that's beginning in 24, and that's what this line you can't see very well is doing. Um, and just that, to clarify, in, in terms of accept students on I, IEPs, is that for all categories of special ed? I don't think it was for all categories. No, it's, it's, that's a whole very complicated topic in yeah. itself. But in summary, basically, um, uh, if, if, a, if the IE, IEP team uh, says that the, the appropriate placement for the student is with an improved independent school, and that school accepts public students of public tuition, then that school has to take that student and has to deliver at least that category of special education. Um, there are 13 or so categories of special education, so they're not required to be delivering all of them. But if a student is placed with that school, they have to deliver what that student needs. Okay. And that was going to be it for what I was about to say. So um, maybe we can uh, come on the document and answer questions. Yeah. 
Um, Representative James. Thanks. So just to clarify about the approved independent schools and make sure I'm understanding it. If, if the IEP team, um, if a student wants to go to the Long Trail School, that's near to me, um, and the IEP team decides that Long Trail would be a great fit for that student, and that student needs a particular category of special ed, Long Trail, if they're going to accept that tuition, the tuitioning money, would also have to say, okay, we will provide the services you need in that category. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Representative Austin is asking, how does the weighting study intersect with the census model? So, great question. Um, so, um, I mentioned uh, earlier that one kind of piece that was left out there was should certain SUs get more, more incentive grant funding? So let's go back and assume that the incentive grant funding is 3000 per student, okay? Um, the report that UVM did said that's, that's fine, but certain SUs that have a lot of students um, that need support may need more funding because it just needs more infrastructure support to support all those students. So rather than 3,000, maybe it should be 3,500 for an extra 500 bucks per student for that, that school, uh, that SU, for example. That question was left out there, um, but it was picked up as part of the waiting study report. Um, uh, Tammy Colby, uh, gave a few options. One option was to basically have a proxy um, for, for those students or those SUs to say, if your, uh, your level of students coming from um, low-income families is high enough, then that's a good proxy for students who need additional support. Therefore, you can grant them more funding. Um, so that's one way of doing it. The other way she said is you could apply the weighting factors um, that they recommended. They had different models for weighting factors. And one of the model models uh, would take the weighting factors and have the weights applied to the census grant to give more money to, for, for um, SUs with students with certain characteristics. So there are a couple of different ways of approaching that question, either by additional grant funding or through weights. And that's still an open question, it hasn't been resolved yet. Um, so and it hasn't been resolved yet whether you even want to give more money. Uh, so A, should there be supplemental grants in the first place or, or, or monies? And if so, how? Um, either through grants or through weights. So that's all a question that's still out there to be answered. And it's also before the census-based funding group, I believe. I think it I think it is. I think they'll have a view on it at least. Yeah. And these suggestions that, that uh, Tammy Colby made were made prior to the weighting study that looked at changing the weights, correct? Well, she did two things, I think. In the in the funding report that led to Act 173. She talked about supplemental funding for these SUs that have a high, higher level of students who need support. And then in the weight study, she modeled the weights different right. ways to, to deal with, it with ways as opposed to grant funding. So she, she approached it in both reports. We'll have Tammy in to talk um, about um, her work on census-based funding and how it relates to this bill. We'll have another conversation with her that's focused on her recommended changes in weights. So, so don't get don't don't feel totally overwhelmed <laughs> as as we do that. Um, other questions, Our Representative Conlon. Yeah, thank Jim. Thanks very much for a, a nice, clear, basic understanding of this. It was very helpful. Uh, I'm trying to remember, did we have a term for the funding that is sort of in place during the interim period between reimbursement and census-based? 
thought we'd had a, that we had a term we were using. No, I mean, it basically goes from reimbursement. Well, <laughs> as I say, uh, it goes from reimbursement to grant funding. Yeah. To census-based funding. So I say that because that first transitional year um, after the last year of reimbursement goes into a grant that is the same amount that you got last year. Yeah, I, I, I thought we had a name for that. I just, I couldn't remember. Thank no, you. So, no, if you if you want to come up with one, we can brainstorm. <laughs> Grant funding sounds fine. Thank you. Yeah, we, our committee could really go down that, that rabbit hole, couldn't it? Trying to come up with a name for that. <laughs> um, Representative Austin. Um, I'm just thinking, um, with Act 46, with the most recent mergers, and the timeline, looking at the timeline, I'm thinking that there's a time, there's a, it, the timeline would work out because it would take about three years, I'm assuming for these mergers to, you know, just develop relationships and working relationships and an infrastructure so that when the census model is implemented, it might be, you know, it seems like all these things are kind of con coming together uh, to be primed for the census model, for really looking at struggling students outside of a special ed model. Does that make sense in terms of what Dr. Levinson was saying about it, you know, to do what we wanna do, we need much more regional, a much more regional approach. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I just see Act 46 of these merges being beneficial to being able to provide students with more um, resources and opportunities. I don't think that's a question for me. <laughs> I, I would just um, remind folks that special ed is actually coordinated at the SU level, so that if you are a small school, it's still coordinated at the SU level. So in a way it's already working like a merged district. Okay. And actually I think Nate Levinson was talking about the fact that even our merged districts are still small for the kind of expertise he thinks we need to bring in. Thank you. Right, the special, special ed was moved to the SU level, I, I think around 2011 or 12, rather than individually. There was a lot of pushback at the time, but I, we have to mention one thing. Uh, sorry, yeah. with the census-based model, as I say, it's census-based, so it's based upon money per student. But um, there is still extraordinary reimbursement. So I mentioned before that under the reimbursement model we have today, if a student costs over fifty thousand, there's ninety percent reimbursement. That still exists under the census-based model because um, there's a, a feeling that you know if a student is way expensive, census-based granting won't be enough. Funding won't be enough. So um, with census-based funding, the reimbursement now is if a student costs over sixty thousand dollars, then there's a ninety-five percent reimbursement by the, by the state. So that piece is still there. So there's still a small piece of reimbursement living with the census based model. Special ed can include um, students that, you know, have, have that, that are minimally expensive. And then there are students that can be very expensive. We have students that are in specialized schools. We have students in hospitals. Um, there are a variety of, of different um, IEP plans that uh, require some pretty expensive support to allow them to receive an education. Um, and so that's viewed more, it's not a district issue, it's really a statewide issue. It just happens to be in your particular district. So the state takes it on that this is a child that belongs to all of us. Um, other questions? All right, we have, um, is there more, is there more that you, that you wanted to present on, on 173, Jim? No, I think so. Okay. Um, we are going to hear from Tammy Colby. She'll be in here at 1130. Um, just any anything anybody wants to, to bring up at this point? 
in relation to this. I'm hoping tomorrow, or excuse me, next week, we will have um, a bill that Sarita has introduced, H101, which starts to look at a, a literacy model that is drawn from 173. So that'll sort of be a, a bill that we'll start with um, to look at um, moving forward with uh, COVID-related recovery and um, 173. Um, but, uh, responses to what uh, Dr. Levinson had said? Does that have interest? Oh, Representative Tooth. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, this, has, this doesn't have to do with it. I just wanted to re remind you, Chair, that I have to hop off in about 35 minutes because we have our county delegation meeting. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'll start whenever I see Tammy and I don't see her in here yet. So we can we can just go on on break for a few minutes, or if she comes in early, we'll be ready to go. Uh, um, Representative Williams, uh, in reference to the previous um, conversations we were having, um, a non-educator and more of on the administrator type side, uh, I really like what I've heard. Um, my biggest concern would be the manpower, the educators uh, coming to Vermont to support this program. You know, I remember way back when I was a student um, and we were starting then to get paraeducators in um, and they all had degrees and they changed that because they weren't enough with degrees uh, willing to come in for the pay. So it all kind of got reverted. And now we're asking more educated people to come in. Are we going to have those numbers? That's a very good question. And I would, I think that would be a really good question for the agency. And Ted Fisher, maybe you could help us with, with that. Uh, I think it's also a really good question for um, the school boards when we get them in. So, so please do hold that question. There is, I believe there is gonna be a proposal on teacher licensing that I, I'm hearing about, which will allow um, reciprocity of uh, licensing. So if someone is holding an a, a educator license in one state that they don't have to uh, go through a lengthy process to be, to be uh, recertified here. Well, I did hear him say that we need to educate within, you know, don't look for outside, uh, create a program here for that. Uh, yeah. That sounds like a pretty large task. Yeah, I've seen some amazing paraeducators go on and, and uh, get their teaching degrees and, and it was a great beginning. Good. Yeah. Um, Representative Austin? Yep. Just real quickly, the thing that really stood out for me was him talking about the five different systems and belief systems and philosophies and changing of culture that need to work simultaneously in order for things to change. And, you know, if we do two or three of these, it's just going to be very expensive and it's not going to be the outcome, you know, that we want. And I don't have any idea how that happens, but I'd love to hear someone, someone knows how that happens, how you get five different systems in a culture you know, to slowly change so that the outcomes are more, you know, that more of our kids are, you know, getting the skills they need. That's all. Thank you. So we're just gonna be introducing a few of our uh, newer folks here. So um, we have some new members. Um, Representative Williams, can you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Terry Williams. I live in Granby. Um, I represent Essex Caledonia. Uh, my history with education is I was a, an administrator at Concord Schools for four years. Uh, after that, I owned a business that employed a lot of these kids. And I've been a coach, an athletic director. What sport did you coach? Uh, elementary basketball. Excellent. Girl. Oh, wow. Girl. <laughs> that sounds my wonderful. most devastating moment was when hairspray came into the locker room at the elementary level. 
Oh no! <laughs> oh, goodness. And Representative Arison. Good morning, Representative Arison. Uh, Cavendish Weathersfield. Nice to meet you, Representative. Thank you. And I don't know if Representative Brown is back. There she is. You're on mute. <laughs> Hello, uh, Representative Jana Brown, representing Chittenden One, which is the town of Richmond. And your background, how you ended uh, so, up on the committee? <laughs> so, that's right. Um, so I've spent the last seven years working for a nonprofit that does uh, children's literacy programming across Vermont and New Hampshire. So working in partnership with schools and libraries. And I don't think we'll have um, Representative Erin Brady. She is a social studies teacher and she is actually teaching. This is her last week. Um, so she's been sort of going in and out between being a legislator and being a teacher. Well, I think we can all appreciate and thank her for her service. Yeah. And if, I, <laughs> if I can, I'll add why I was put on the committee. I've been told because I add an outside perspective since I don't have an education background. Except that you went to school. <laughs> Great. Um, so Could welcome. I jump in and share my screen. Would that be sort of a? That'd be oh, great. Before, before I do that, um, I, I know uh, I know many of you. I just met some of you. Uh, before before I jump into presentation, maybe maybe just quickly, I could introduce myself Please to do. some of the new members. Um, I'm Tammy Colby. I'm an associate professor of educational leadership and policy studies at the University of Vermont. Um, my background is uh, in actually in having worked in state budget offices um, and working in state legislators. I actually worked for several governors uh, on both sides of the aisle before becoming an academic. And then my academic sort of research and teaching interests are really um, grounded in this idea of how do we use resources in education and strategic ways to promote our goals, right? And so with that, I think a lot about resource allocation by districts and schools, but I also do a lot of work around school finance and funding. And so I know a number of you who have been on the committee before know me for some of the work I've already done in Vermont in the last few years. Um, I was the primary author of the report that predated Act 173 um, the study of special education in the state. And um, maybe I have some notoriety also now for having been the primary author of the waiting study report, <laughs> which I suspect we might be talking about again some other time. This I, I think we probably will be. Um, <laughs> the committee, um, the committee uh, just the, the, but, where we've been so far, the, the committee has just heard from um, Nate Levinson on his, his part and um, Jim Demery has gone through some of the aspects of Act 173. Sure. Sure. So now we are delighted to welcome you. And related to this morning, my talk this morning and sort of um, in your request, uh, this summer I spent time working with the National Conference for State Legislators. I think I mentioned uh, that is in my presentation, but also just want to highlight that, that I, that I spent time this summer working with NCSL on these exact issues around thinking about how do state legislators and legislatures respond sort of strategically with education dollars and education resources in the wake of COVID. And so it's it's that package of background and ex expertise that I bring to sort of my remarks today. So I'm going to share my screen now, or at least we all hope I will. Um, let's see, make sure I've got it. Huh, that's interesting. One minute. I have a new computer and it wants me to give permission to Zoom. I apologize for that. I think you've been made a co-host, so you should be able Yeah, to it's a, it's, um, one moment. And if so, you can also always send it to Jesse and she can take she care of it. She has it. Okay. Let me just let me know if you'd like me to share. Yeah, it's asking, the issue is, is I have a new operating system and it's asking me to quit Zoom. So if you could, um, I apologize for that. I didn't realize that would be an issue. Uh, Jesse, if you wouldn't mind sharing, that would be really helpful. Thank you for doing that. Not, not a problem. I do just want to note um, in your last email where you sent me the updated version, I didn't see that attached. So whatever update you made won't reflect That's on. Fine. That's okay. fine. That's fine. So as, as Jesse brings it up, um, by way of background for today's, for my, um, what I want to talk about today is three considerations 
um, that I'd like to suggest to the legislature as they sort of wrestle with these issues that we're all facing around learning loss and also sort of what do we do on the education funding front? Just if you can move the slide down. And my three considerations, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, are really grounded in what we know about what practitioners in the field are going to need to successfully respond to a broad range of student needs, including learning loss, right? They're, they're, we have to acknowledge that there are going to be a bunch of different kinds of things that we're going to ever respond to. But in the wake of COVID-19, particularly practitioners in the field are going to need to, one, develop context-specific and even student-specific responses to COVID related learning loss, right? So it, we're going to have to deal with systems and individuals. Two, they're really going to need to build a turbocharge, if you think about exist their capacity of their existing programs and practices to respond to student need. And three, they're going to need to maximize the impact of existing and new funding by strategically al aligning what they have in terms of existing funding, but also um, new funding with critical needs. And we, it's with those three sort of three items as background, I offer the three these three considerations to the committee and, and policymakers generally in Vermont. The first one is we need to think carefully about what we can do in this moment to leverage the flexibility and how existing federal and state special education funds can be used to serve all students. That's the first consideration. And I'll go into the details of each of these considerations in just a minute, but I'd like to preview what are the three considerations up front. Two, we need to prioritize and strengthen our existing systems and programs to provide supports to students. And three, we need to think about targeting any new resources toward providing support in locations and for students who are most in need. Okay, so three, three considerations. Jesse, if you could flip the slide. So the first one is around leveraging flexibility and how existing funds are used. Our both federal and state, in particular, our special education funding have actually inherent in, in the regulations and the guidance have a lot of flexibility in how those dollars could be used. In fact, that was one of the underlying premises for Act 173. And one of the findings in the Act 173 study was that the existing reimbursement model really restricted how funds could be used to allowable purposes. And these restrictions around allowable use were creating silos and barriers to flexibly serving and developing multi-tiered systems of support in schools and districts. And it's those multi-tiered systems of support that we are desperately going to need in order to respond to learning loss, as well as to a range of other kinds of student needs in the wake of COVID. And so the first key consideration here is we need to move forward with implementing Act 173. Um, this is the moment is now. The flexibility is desperately needed in the field going forward in order to strengthen MTSS and respond to COVID-19. The second thing is related to moving Act 173 forward, and that is to ensure the guidance promulgated by AOE for allowable use in federal and state special education dollars is consistent with the broadest intent in federal law and state law, right? There's a continuum here of how, right? Our guidance in the state can be more or less restricted with regard to how it is that local school districts are able to use both federal and state dollars for special education. And one of the, the key underlying premises of 173 is to open up that flexibility to build strong tiered systems of support for students with and without disabilities. That does not mean in any way, shape or form that we should be backing away from serving students with disabilities, but also recognizing that at the same time, particularly with COVID related learning loss, that some of the needs of non-disabled students around learning loss are going to be very similar to those needs of students with learning needs of students with disabilities. And we wanna build flexible systems that where we're able to serve all students in our tiered systems of support without having to create siloed programs that are special education, general education, et cetera. And so we wanna make sure that the regulations, the guidance that's ultimately promulgated for 173 is as broad as possible with regard to the allowable uses 
And one of the things that has been sort of a hiccup in doing that has been this understanding around what counts for maintenance of financial support for federal dollars. And I attached to the end of this presentation a policy brief that I worked on with NCSL, and I can provide additional guidance on that as well, where the feds are actually allow federal dollars to be used quite broadly, and we should maximize that. The second, the third thing that we can do in this moment is we can really encourage school districts, supervisor unions, and schools to use their federal IDA funding as a source of support for early intervening services for non-disabled and disabled students. We know that many districts underspend this, this pot of money called CEIS dollars. We need to maximize right, our use of those federal dollars for early intervening services. And those early intervening services benefit all students, not just students with disabilities or without disabilities. They also help strengthen our tier one and our multi-tiered systems of support. And right now, if we think about Right, the inter kind of interventions and the kind of responses we're going to need to learning loss that is COVID related, those early intervening services are exactly what school districts are going to be really trying to put in place. And so we need to really encourage districts to maximize to the extent possible the use of these CEIS dollars. Could you just um, add that the, the um, CEIS? Uh... Acronym. Those are the early intervening services dollars that are the comprehensive early intervening services dollars that are set aside in IDEA Part B funding, federal funding, right? And I can give you more details on that. I'm trying to stay within my 15 minutes. <laughs> um, the fourth thing we can do is we can really start to encourage districts and schools and provide them with the technical support they need to do that to coordinate coordinate and consolidate criteria for eligibility and funds across federal and state programs. This is known as blending and braiding funding. It's being done nationally. And rather than creating siloed programs, again, that are tied to certain funding sources, which is oftentimes the case, the idea is that we blend and we braid funds within schools so that we can provide comprehensive services without having to identify a student as this kind of student or this, right, or eligible for this program. The funds are commingled, they're tracked appropriately for federal law, but they're blended and they're braided in kind in ways that allow us again to respond in a systemic comprehensive way to student needs. And if we think about what schools and practitioners in particular are going to face here in the next nine to 12 months is exactly that, needing the flexibility to develop systems of support respond to individual student needs without having to categorize students for particular programs, right? We wanna build holistic systems of support in schools and districts. Could you, could you just say, do you know if the CEIS funds uh, flow through the Agency of Education? Yes, they do. Yep, they do. Yep. Okay. Yep, they do. They do. Um, uh, Jesse, next slide, please. The second consideration um, is to prioritize and strengthen existing systems and programs. And I think this suggestion certainly comes out of my experience um, working with legislators, working in governor's offices, is that particularly at moments like this, the, 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 the Sometimes we, we want to respond with new programs and new things and in new initiatives, right, in response to crises like this. When in fact, what, we, what is, makes better sense, right, is to really turbocharge our existing infrastructure, both with resources, but also the technical assistance it needs to do an even better job or to adapt to the current circumstances. And so what we want to do in this moment, our second key consideration is to prioritize and strengthen existing systems and programs to provide st supports to students. And there are two big systems or programs in our that are already in most districts and schools in the state. One by man, one is one is required, the other other is optional where we can really leverage and harness existing systems. And the first one is our multi-tiered systems of support, which are in fact intended and designed for moments exactly like this, right? Where we provide tiered interventions according to student need or groups of student need. These systems of support right now are one of the most important investments we should be making, right? In developing robust, 
tiered systems of interventions and supports for students as they interact with school, come back to school, we identify learning loss, we identify other kinds of needs. And so in this moment it is going to be incredibly important that we reinforce the importance of these systems back to school districts and back to the flexibility and funding. We allow districts to leverage existing funds in a way that they can actually build the scaffolded system and turbocharge that system to respond to what is going to be emerging and increasing student need. The so second we know, just so, so we know that um, MTSS in this state has a variety of interpretations. It sure does. <laughs> based on supervisory union school districts. So there are some that have a fairly sophisticated way of addressing this and some that Perhaps not. Some don't. And so, so in systems where we have mature, in districts or supervisor unions where we have mature MTSS systems, right, um, then the task is to really make, really help them have the flexibility and funding to turbocharge their existing system. In supervisory unions that have less robust systems or are more nascent in emerging systems, then the task is twofold. One, to help them really to, first of all, reinforce the importance of this as the, right, as the response mechanism to these needs. And two, then help them build and build, strengthen those systems. And then three, making sure that our funding models are aligned with the flexibility that those tiered systems of support are going to need to operate effectively. So you're right, there's variability here. And that's why I've, I phrase this carefully, Kate, which is we need to reinforce the importance of this. And in places where these systems are more naive, more nascent, emerging, or not as strong, they've got to we they've got to be strengthened. And some of that is some of this has nothing to do with money. Some of that is just technical assistance capacity and maybe some good old fashioned arm wrangling, right? Like this, but MT, the MTSS systems, and you'll hear more about this from Megan Roy this afternoon, are really well positioned to be the first line of defense against some of the some of the key student specific issues that are going to be emerging here that already are emerging and will continue to emerge. The second thing is we also have to recognize that in addition to MTSS, that we're going to need to leverage and expand existing programs to provide supplemental academic services through extended learning opportunities, right? That are either extended learning opportunities over the summer or after school. And there's a really good body of research emerging on tutoring programs, but that are individualized, also group tutoring programs. And these are, the, right, so thinking about what these programs are going to look like and building the capacity in these programs for summer and for, right, reinforcement and academic extension in the after school settings, right? And we already know we can harness the existing capacity of our federally funded 21C or 20, 21st Com Century Community Center, Community Center Program, which uh, in any given year has more applications for federal funding than we have available. There's, there's a demand, right? And we have infrastructure around those programs. Again, rather than starting to build a whole new set of programs, let's leverage the existing capacity in our summer programs and our after school programs to provide those more targeted academic services and supports that we're gonna need in addition to what students are receiving during the school day as a part of school districts, multi-tiered systems of support. Next slide. And then there's this question of, well, if there's new money, right? What, what do we do about that? Um, and there may be new federal money and, and the state may also put some new money in. And so whenever we have new money, we have to think really carefully about that. And we can think about dividing it equally, everybody gets the same, or we can think about targeting. And, and one, of the, one of the things we know from in the wake of two, that, the 2008 recession is that targeting was a really effective practice. So rather than distributing dollars equally, we want to target new resources toward providing support in locations and for students who are most in need. Right, so we want to triage any new dollars that are coming in to target them at places and students who are most at risk, who have been most affected, and who are going to have, right, the largest, in this case, largest learning loss, right, had been most effective. But in doing that, 
right? We're going to have to think about what are the distribution mechanisms? Like what are the metrics that we're gonna to use to say who's most effective? How do we make those decisions? And then how do we wait or make decisions about distributing dollars unequally, but equitably? Because not equal is not always fair, right? And so if we say we wanna target dollars at those who most need, we gotta figure out how are we going to do that in a way that we're getting dot, the, dollars not just in the right hands, but the right amount of dollars in the right hands. The other thing that was in the updated slides, it's not on, and this is, a, I updated my slides instead of just, see this, this, there's a second consideration here too, and that is what do you do with one-time money, right? So the, so the risk is when you get one-time money, we wanna be thinking about one-time investments that build capacity or deal with specific interventions, such as a summer program, right? We wanna think really hard about how we use one-time money and not build into our system long-term liability that we, can't, that we can't shore up with recurring dollars later on, right? So if we get one-time money, we wanna invest it in one-time kind of investments right? Rather than building it into our budget base. So if we create it, we put a bunch of interventionists, we hire a bunch of staff, when that one-time money goes away, what are we going to do? That, right? Are we going to continue to pay for those staff? Maybe, maybe that makes sense, but oftentimes it doesn't. And so I'm always, I'm always sort of, I always want to be sort of cautious when we get one-time money, particularly in this case where we maybe get federal one-time money, that we're thinking really strategically about how do we use those dollars strategically, right, for one-time investments that really move the needle on important things, but don't necessarily create longer-term cost liabilities that we can't sustain with operating budgets going forward. So those are my three big considerations, right? Open up and maintain, right? Prior, focus on flexibility, maximizing flexibility and exist how we can use existing funds. Two, prioritize and strengthen our existing systems. And three, where we have new money, let's target those resources and think carefully about one-time dollars. So three big considerations grounded in what the needs will be from practitioners. And at the end of this um, presentation, if you can move one slide down for me, um, are links to the two policy briefs that I was involved in writing this summer. One, I was a co-author on the other one I contributed to. One is on how do we think about maximizing flexibility and we in using our federal and state special education dollars. And the other one is a brief on how do we think about blending and braiding dollars across multiple federal and state sources so that we, we open up more flexibility in how dollars can be used. So that's my presentation. So I'd like to open it up for questions and comments. And Jesse, I think you can take it down. Great, thanks. Thank you. That's helpful. I try to think in three. It's like, what are three big ideas we can, we can start to work with? And, and hopefully that provides a good framework. I like to think in terms of policy frameworks, like this is a framework that, that the committee can start to use as questions and concerns come up. So I know that one of the things that, that I had sort of been planning on, which as we know about plans, um, that these were going to be similar to the CRF funds that are coming in, that we would actually be in charge of appropriating. But these are the ESSER funds that actually do not uh, involve um, uh, the legislature. However, I, I'm not, I can't remember if ESSER funds are coming related to um, Title I. Are you, do you know if that's happening or is I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, I so think because, the I think I heard the allocation method of the ESSER funds is still based on Title One. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. I just don't know how they're flowing. Right? right. Is that the question that you were asking, or are you talking about the allocation? I, I was. I was how it was how it was flowing. And and Ted, I think we're eventually going to get an, an update from uh, your shop on. Um, yeah, I think that's a question for a AOE CFO, um, uh, who's very knowledgeable on this and can provide sort of, you know, some of those down in the weeds details. What I, my goal today was to be a little, little bit more up here with regard to like, here are some big ideas that, that can help guide conversation and consideration as things like that come up. Mm -hmm. And you, you have been in touch with uh, with Nate Levinson as well, I, I believe. Correct. Oh yeah, um, yeah. 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 So good. Um, we just it's a small community. <laughs> yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, Representative Conlon. 
right back on that topic of the ESSER money, which is one-time dollars. Um, could you talk a little bit more specifically about some ideas for using that money sure. to? Sure. Um, and I think. That, sure. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to couch this with my first bullet though, which is, you know, the decisions that we ultimately make are going to need to be context specific. Right. So every school, like the conditions in every school district are going to look a little different. The needs of students are going to look a little different. And so I want to be careful about one size fits all, but I think we can start to think about what might be some of those kinds of investments that we know would could pay off. One is summer summer programs, right? So taking some of those ESSA dollars and putting them into summer programs for this summer probably makes a lot of sense, particularly given the clock on some of those funds, right? Right, you've got, a, you've got a spending timeline. And so investing some of those dollars in summer programs probably makes a lot of sense. The same, the same kind of thing with targeted academic interventions and support. Um, Matt Kraft, a colleague of mine out of Brown University has been doing a lot of work on tutoring programs and seeing a lot of success with that individualized and small group. So investing in tutoring programs right, that could be district specific, but also they, maybe they could be, they could transcend district boundaries where we're grouping students more broadly. That's another option. Um, you know, I'm always real careful about thinking in terms of using, so those are two on one side. Let me, let me flip to the other side. Things to be cautious about. We want to be real cautious about investments, like I said, that create longer term cost liabilities and budgets that we may not be able to maintain. And so staff is always tricky. Right. And so if you're thinking about tutoring, you know, this might be an opportunity to create statewide or district tutoring programs that are targeted and finite in duration. Right. Um, but again, back to my second bullet, which is let's let's point let's point those dollars to existing programs rather than creating new. So let's use our existing ve vehicles, such as our extended learning programs already right, who are already on the ground, have infrastructure where we could turbocharge their capacity, potentially, Representative Colin, right, to provide tutor, right? And it's an influx of one-time money where they provide this. I think, you know, again, th being real careful with using one-time money or even any money at this point to start new programs or new, and try to, we, we need to, first of all, we need to move too quickly. And second of all, it creates more, more administrative costs and third, it creates a potentially this longer term cost burden. And so that's why I said, so had that second consideration, which is even with one time money, let's think about how can we invest that in a way where we're turbocharging existing highly effective programs or using it to improve the effectiveness of existing programs out there. Does, does that help represent come? Yeah. We did have that, we did, uh put together an after school work group. I think we're going to be hearing from them. We just, everything happened so late and then that was last minute. So I think we'll be hearing from them in, in the spring. I would say on the after school though, um, and this is in my power, is in my slides, but I, I do want, um, and I've done a lot of work on after school programs too. And I, I don't want to slight after school programs that are not affiliated with public schools. So let me be clear about that. However, in this moment with the challenge that public schools and the responsibility that's put on public schools with regard to learning loss, I would strongly suggest that the investments and the priority be placed on extended learning opportunities that are connected to public schools that are connected to these multi-tiered systems of support so that we don't end up, again, fracturing efforts or duplicating efforts, right? So school districts and schools through their recovery plans are gonna be really on deck to coordinate and figure out the nuances of all, all of these pieces and parts. And to the extent that we start bringing in other entities, it just makes it, makes it harder. And we run the risk of duplicating administrative costs and bureaucracy and things along those lines. So that would be the one thing I would say on that. And again, not sliding expanded learning opportunities that are not affiliated with public schools, but in this moment where time matters a lot, right? And we wanna think really carefully about investing scarce dollars. I mean, dollars are always scarce, but they're really scarce right now. We gotta be really sharp 
and think carefully about efficiencies, both in terms of return and not generating more costs, but also how do we get dollars out and, and results quickly, right? Without duplicating and things along the way. We just don't have a lot, we, we don't have a lot of bandwidth for that. We don't have the resources and we don't have the time. Thank First you. Austin, do I see your hand up? Just, I just wanna say it's, it's noon. Thing. So mm -hmm. it's noon. Um, why don't we, if, if you're fo everybody's okay, we'll, we'll allow an additional uh, 10 minutes. Floor doesn't start. I don't know if people have, have other things that they need to do, but I, I'm happy to take us till 1210 and then we cut out. Is that okay? I'm, I, my time is yours. So okay, whatever great. works for you. Representative Austin. Um, yes, I'm just assuming that, I mean, it seems everybody's assuming that there's been learning loss because mm -hmm. of remote instruction, but there may have been learning gained mm -hmm. in terms of remote instruction. And I'm wondering if, you know, you don't need to answer the question now, but I'd be very curious about looking, someone must be using this as an opportunity to look at, you know, how we continue, can continue to use remote learning yeah. to advance instruction. And I'm thinking after school and tutoring, I mean, you know, we could be meeting a lot of kids' needs if we could do it remotely. So you don't need to answer that now, but I'm, I'm curious about hearing about that. So yes, yeah, right. So, so, you know, crisis can be the mother of innovation, right? And so I think, I think we're learning a lot about how to leverage online learning. And this goes to my third slide around targeting. You know, not all kids have been affected in the same way, right? For some kids, for example, I was talking to some educators in an alternative school for students who have socio-emotional issues. And this has been terrific because going to school, the physical act of going to school is extremely hard. And this has been, this has been amazing for them. There are other students we know that don't have broadband access or we haven't been able to even get a head count on, right? So that's where this idea of targeting is so important. And the targeting is going to have to be context specific because we have to recognize that these conditions are not just going to vary student to student, they're going to vary school to school, district to district. Some districts live in areas that have been, I'm going to just use broadband as an example representative, where, where access to broadband has been a more significant issue than other schools, right, districts. We, are, we, we know that household wealth, right, matters right now in this, right? In that families who have more resources have been able to invest their own resources. So this is where that idea of targeting, I mean, you're right on track, right? We have to think about how do we target programs, practices, and resources, all three of those things, to the students who need it most, which is why I am cautioning against these flat, you know, if we have new dollars, right? Like just flat, flat allocation, because not everybody needs them in the same way. And also hopefully in, in, in sort of in the wake of this, we will have that moment where we can look back and say, for whom was this a positive, right? And how do we reinforce that? So I, I think your thinking is right on track there. Others. So I'm sure that a lot of us are thinking, how do we put this into legislative action? And I will admit that I'm struggling on how we move this to legislative action. Um, so this might be a conversation with, with Jim Demaray, our, our ledge counsel. Um, and well, some of these things aren't legislative activities, right? Right. right. So that's where this gets tricky, right? right. So I think you know, certainly your role, Representative Webb and this committee, you know, think, I think that's a really good question, which is where do you fit in this conversation? I would strongly suggest that these considerations are considerations, not just for the legislature, but for the agency of education, health and human service. Like these, these are the big ideas. And so I think by getting some common ground, like these are our, these, here's our, here are our guardrails. Like this is how we're starting to think about it. But then thinking strategically about on whom, what responsibilities fall is going to be really important. And I'm not sure all of these things are legislatable. Right? That doesn't mean that as legislators in this committee with the important role it has in making policy and encouraging good practice doesn't mean that you're not part of that conversation. It just may, may not be something that is handled in statute. Right. 
But there's a thing called session law. That's right. That's right. There is a thing called session law. There's yeah. also a thing called policy guidance and direction mm -hmm. and collaborate, right? Like, and so the policy levers here are a little different mm -hmm. than maybe in other situations, but I, I see this committee as being really important in that conversation. If for no other reason than defining what defining what the guardrails are and say like these are the principles like here are the key things that we should be using as it, right across the board. Right. So we can direct the agency. We can direct the state board. Right. And say these are our priorities. Mm -hmm. And in a, in terms of appropriations, we can right here. Here's how we want to think about that when the guidance is coming out on the on the Act 173 regs. Does it look like that, right? The question of do we push Act 173 out another year? That's something you can act on, right? You're like, There are things that are legislative or things where I think this committee can play a really important role, but maybe not in the traditional sense of, you know, statute. Right. So Kupali, did I see your hand go up or were you just nodding along with me? You're muted. <laughs> No, I was just nodding because I totally agree with you. There, there are different methods, different ways, other than legislation. Which is why I bring the question into the committee um, for us to rem remember where where our role is really important and where where it is not, where we can actually cause problems. Moving forward. But I, I, I hope that in my in sort of my brief presentation that laying out these as three big sort of goalposts or considerations can help start to frame. And there's lots of discussion, more discussion to be had under each one of these, but like that this can start to help frame this committee's thinking around that. And, and I'm happy to come back and, and talk more specifically about items. But I thought in this first 15, 20 minutes, just trying to get a big, like how do we organize our thinking around all of this might be the most useful sort of point of entry into the conversation. Thank you. Jim, did you want to say anything? No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. Of course. And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, you know, just email me. Um, I think every, if you don't have my email, I, I can share it with Jesse. I probably should have put it in the PowerPoint, but I'm always open to responding to questions and having conversations around things like this. Um, so just let me know how I can support you all this session. All right, I see that it's 12.07. Thank you, Tammy. So Good Tammy, we're probably and nice to, nice to meet some of the new members. I, I look forward to seeing you, I guess, maybe later this session on the waiting study. <laughs> yes, exactly. We've just had the, the, a bill presented to us. There's also a bill in the Senate. Um, oh. and we, we need a, a time to actually have committee members um, understand the work that you did. I'm happy to always answer questions. Okay, great. Right. Everyone be well. It's good to see everyone. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And with that, um, everybody enjoy your, your time off. We can go off YouTube.